All right, welcome everybody to DSLR Fast Start. My name is John Gringo, and in this class, we're gonna be looking at the Nikon D7000. This is a uh, fairly new camera from Nikon, and it is packed filled with features. I've been going through this camera for the last few weeks and exploring kind of all that it has to offer, and uh, I'm, I'm gonna give this camera a new nickname. This is the New York City of cameras because it has everything. Um, for good or for bad, it it's just seems to have everything in it. It's got uh, amazing number of features in it and capabilities. It should be a camera that uh, I think any photographer would be happy to own from beginner to professional. It's just got uh, a lot of features and a lot of capability, but you do of course have to know how to access all those and what they do and when to use them because we're not gonna use all the features uh, nobody uses all the features on any particular camera. It's knowing which ones to use and when to use them. And so hopefully in this class, uh, as we go through things, you'll be able to mark off the items that are most important to you. We're going to go through the camera from the outside to the inside, going through all the menus, all the buttons, and we should be able to figure out most everything that this camera can do. And so hopefully it'll uh, enable you to figure out how to use your camera for whatever it is that you want to do with it. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Um, as we get started, I just want to uh, throw a thanks out to B&H Photo uh, for supplying us uh, the camera that we're going to be using here in this uh, classroom today. It's a great source of photographic materials, and uh, they've been helping us here at Creative Live, and I do want to thank them very much for that. So kind of the plan for today is that uh, we have several different sections that we're going to go through. Uh, first off, I just want to talk about the product in general. It's a Nikon camera. I'll talk a little bit about the whole system that you have gotten into by buying a, by buying a Nikon camera. Uh, involved in working this camera is quite a bit of photography, and this is not exactly a photography class. It's a, cam it's a class on how to use this particular camera. Uh, but there are some photography basics that I want to make sure everybody has before we get too far into the camera. Uh, then we're going to basically just going to get uh, going around the camera, button by button, talking about what it does um, and how to use it. We will go through the menu system line by line. So if you've recently got your camera and you want to get it set up the way you want to, uh, this is going to be a good opportunity as we step through the menu items to, to make those changes and to see what they do. Uh, then we're going to get in and figure out how to actually set the camera up for real photography, and that's the camera operation section uh, where we will be making certain adjustments to figure out where all the most important adjustments are. And I'll be throwing a little bit of uh, opinions out there as to how to set the camera up for different types of situations, whether you're shooting portraits or action, landscapes, um, or other types of things. How, what focus mode, what metering mode, things like that is best for that. And then finally, we'll talk about lenses and accessories, and we're going to keep it fairly short and simple and just talk about a few of the prime things that you might be interested in if you're a new owner to the D7000. So let's go ahead and get started with this product overview. So with the camera, you are going to get yourself a nice, thick instruction manual. It's uh, got about 326 pages, and I figure you can easily spend about 11 hours just reading through that manual. And it's a very good thing to have. There's going to be a lot of information in there that we don't have time to get to in this class. Um, our class uh, is going to be around five hours. And so I don't know how to fit 11 hours into five hours worth of uh, time. And uh, I am going to skip over a few areas. And I will talk about those areas when I get to them. But in general, this camera has a lot of capabilities. And a lot of those capabilities are for people who don't have computers and they want to do all their post-processing work in camera. They want to trim their images, they want to boost the color, saturation, and do a number of other things. And I'm not going to get too heavily into that. Most people who have this camera are working with a computer and a software program like Lightroom or Photoshop or some other program. And so those, that's kind of the main areas that I'm going to be skipping over. Uh, but we'll be talking about pretty much everything that's important to shooting good pictures in the camera. Now, as I mentioned at the introduction, this is not a Photography 101 class. And so if you're looking for just learning all the fundamentals of photography, well, this isn't exactly the right class. I'm sure there'll be a lot of things that you pick up on here. If you are new to photography, uh, you haven't used a digital camera before, or you've stepped up to an SLR for the first time, there's going to be some things that we go by pretty quickly. Uh, it's kind of assumed that you know at this point, or uh, it's assumed that you will get that information soon after this class. 
and I'm going to recommend a photography class to you if you haven't taken one at this point. It's great that you're here uh, because learning your camera is probably the first and important step uh, in, in getting better at photography. And so it's, you're in a good place right now. Uh, knowing the camera is a good thing. But once you've done that, learning more about photography will definitely improve the quality of your work. So let's talk about what you've gotten yourself into when you purchased a D7000 or maybe have received it as a gift. Uh, you've got yourself a Nikon camera, and uh, Nikon is a Japanese company that uh, has been in business for quite some time. They uh, are a pretty large company, well-respected in the industry. They make a lot of different cameras, from amateur cameras to professional cameras. They make spotting scopes and binoculars, and they do a lot in the medical uh, imaging industry. Uh, so they're a very large company, and they have a lot of uh, power behind them, you might say, in uh, making products. They started back in about 1917. They were actually kind of a conglomeration of three of the leading Japanese optical manufacturers at the time. Uh, things really got going after World War II. In 1948, they brought out their first rangefinder camera, which is different than a single lens reflex, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then in 1959, they uh, established their first SLR, and that camera has basically the same lens mount that the D7000 has on it. And the Nikon lens mount has been a big part of their heritage because they have not changed that in that entire time. And there has been an evolution of lenses. The lenses have changed and they are not completely compatible under all circumstances. They've been, as I say, evolving and changing. But you, with this camera, you can use pretty much any lens uh, made over the last 20 years. And uh, you can use the lenses that are made for this on some cameras that are 20, 30, or 40 years old in some cases. And so they have a very long lineage with their line, with their lenses. 1986, they brought out their first autofocus camera, and that was kind of a, a profound change uh, for the SLRs. And then in 1999, they brought out their first digital SLR, the D1. And when you think about this camera, which sells for oh, just over $1,000 or so and has 18 megapixels, the D1 had a whopping 2.7 megapixels and cost $5,500. So this, uh, this camera really blows that one out of the water as far as resolution and uh, price for that. So with Nikon, you have gotten yourself into a really good single lens reflex system. First off, they have a lot of cameras. As I said, they have beginner cameras, they have professional cameras. Uh, so as you grow or need different types of cameras, Nikon is likely to have something that's going to uh, entice you. Their lenses have been one of their uh, strongest uh, reasons why people have, people have liked Nikon. They have very, very good lenses. They have a wide range of lenses. Pretty much anything you want to do, they probably make a lens for it. And then for a flash system, they are really, really good with flash system. Really, they really have led the industry in creative uses on the flash, making them easier, more sophisticated. Uh, more capable of doing many different things. And so they have a great, great flash system. So if you have any need for automatic flash, um, they're really very good at that. The D7000 itself, it's kind of positioned in heritage within the uh, Nikon lineup. It's, it's kind of on the intermediate level of their cameras. It's kind of in the middle of the line. They have some cameras below it. They have some cameras above it. The D7000 came out in 2010, and it is roughly based on the D90, which is based on the D80, which goes back to the D70. And so it's about the fifth in a generation. And with each generation, Nikon looks at what they're doing, and they keep making it better. And so each of these cameras is incrementally better than the last. And this is just the, the latest in a long line of very, very good cameras. So the D7000 itself, uh, has some a number of improvements over the previous model and we just kind of want to go over those it is 16 megapixels it's actually the second highest in nikon's lineup it's not kind of the second in position with everything else but it's it's a new camera they have a lot more megapixels in there now the previous camera had 12 megapixels so the resolution is going to be a little bit higher on this camera they're improving the video capabilities the previous camera was the first slr to have video capabilities and uh, they now have that at full HD standards, which is 1920 by 1080. They've uh, increased the ISO so that you can use higher ISOs in this camera. They've improved the focusing system, more focusing points, more cross-type focusing. 
and they've improved the frames per second. So we can now shoot at six frames per second in this camera. Previous camera was only 4.5 frames per second. So when you buy a camera, what do you get in the box? Uh, there's a list of all the goodies that you're going to get in the box. And we're going to go ahead and unbox the camera that we have here in front of us and just kind of take a look at what we're getting here. So let's go ahead and open this guy up. So first off, uh, you're going to get some paperwork. There'll be some warranty cards in here. There's going to be some software and this is going to be so that you can download the raw images. They also have viewers so that you can view the images. If you have a program like Lightroom, you may not need any of the software programs at all. Um, it depends on what software you like. Personally, uh, I as well as a lot of other photographers like using Lightroom uh, and that's kind of a whole other class in itself. But they do give you some software if you don't have anything at all. Uh, of course, they have the instruction manual find the English version here. Uh, so we do have a good thick instruction manual here and it is good to kind of go through that and keep it handy while you are a new owner of the camera. So where do we start? Let's go for the good stuff, the camera right here. So we got ourselves a brand new camera here. That's nice, we'll set that down right there. Go for the lens next. The, uh, this is a kit that we have here, and uh, it comes with an 18 to 105 lens, which is a real good general purpose lens. Looks like that right there. Uh, it does also come with a lens hood that I highly recommend using, but for in this class, I'm not going to put it on for right now, but it is something that is good to have. We'll talk about those later on in accessories. And then we have a whole little box of accessories here. Let's go ahead and set this aside. And in here we're going to have the battery, which is very important. We'll have a battery charger. Very creative system. You can either use a cable or they have a direct plug-in that you can plug it directly into the wall. We have cables for downloading the memory uh, directly from the camera to the computer. I personally prefer a card reader. Uh, but they do have this so that you can do it without anything else. We have cables to hook the camera up to a TV so that you can use it as a slideshow uh, and view images projected kind of from this onto your TVs. And then we have a camera strap and then a little eyepiece cover that goes over the back of the eyepiece. And so I'm going to set uh, this aside here. this up and keep the important things out right here and we will assemble this in uh, just a moment. So uh, on the battery charge I will just mention this it takes about two hours to charge the battery and you're likely to get 400 to 600 shots out of it but it completely depends on how you drive your car here uh, what sort of gas mileage you're going to get depends on how often you're viewing your images stabilization, live view, movie shooting, it's going to vary quite a bit. I highly recommend having a second battery. I think it's good to have a backup battery uh, just in case there's something really good and you know, run through your whole battery life. And so an extra battery is definitely one accessory that I would recommend. Let's talk about the uh, care and handling of this camera because there's a lot of warnings in the instruction manual. And uh, it's, it's, it's almost humorous. In fact, I think it kind of is a little humorous just reading some of the things it says, like don't get it too hot, don't get it too cold. Don't drop it, don't get it wet, don't take it apart, don't leave it by a giant magnet. Don't store it with lots of corro corrosive chemicals. Don't store it with highly radioactive material. Don't fire the flash at someone driving a car. Don't use around flammable gas and don't swallow the battery, which I think is a really good one. <laughs> Uh, in essence, don't be stupid with it. I, I think we all kind of get that. Uh, but it does also have warning, a warning that says something like, this camera is not waterproof, do not get it wet. And this often concerns people because uh, they're not really sure how wet do you mean. Because uh, obviously dropping it in the river, you know, where it was fully submerged, is going to be a major problem and would probably uh, die on impact uh, in, in a below, going below surface like that. But what about a light rain? What about a heavy rain? What about a moderate rain? What about a little bit of coffee that gets spilled on it? Well, it kind of depends on how much and where the water gets to. The outside shell of the camera is plastic, and so that's not really a problem with the water. It's just that there's a whole bunch of electronics on the inside, and there's a whole bunch of buttons and dials and places for the water to get through. 
And so if water gets through those gaps and get it, gets on the circuitry, that's when you're going to have a problem. If it was my camera and it was raining out, I would try to avoid shooting out in the direct rain for any prolonged length of time. If it was just going to be for a minute or two and the camera wasn't going to get that wet, I probably wouldn't bother, I wouldn't worry about it. If you could keep it under your coat, if you had it under an umbrella and it got a little bit of water, that's probably not going to be a problem. I usually uh, don't have a problem shooting out in the rain, but sometimes I'll have a plastic cover or I'll have a uh, towel that I'm trying to keep the camera clean or covered with as much as possible. And so I think a light rain for a short period of time is not going to cause a problem. Um, and so you do have to have uh, some, some common sense as to how to use it in a wet environment. The other thing that it will warn you about is use of non-Nikon accessories could damage the camera and may void your warranty. There are all, all sorts of things that you can hook up to this camera, different lenses, batteries, memory cards, and then there's all sorts of cables that you can put into it, USB connections, video cables, remotes, GPS units, things like that. And Nikon does not want to be held liable if you decide to plug in something that's rather stupid on it. Uh, in general, there isn't anything that's going to damage the camera that is commonly available on the market. Uh, you can put other brands of lenses on there. The slight downside is there may be a feature or two within the camera that is communicating with the lens, and there's more of these things these days, and we'll talk about these when we get into the menu system, uh, that the camera may not be able to communicate with the lens as to what lens it is, and it may not be able to perform a couple of special functions. Uh, with batteries, Nikon makes their own batteries. There are aftermarket batteries that are probably going to be safe to work in there. I haven't seen a problem with them, uh, but they may not last as long as the Nikon batteries. Uh, with the Nikon flashes, they make really, really good flashes, and uh, I would highly recommend going with the Nikon flashes. There are other aftermarket flashes. Uh, you do want to make sure if you do use them that they are designed to work for Nikon. You don't want to buy a product that's designed to work for another manufacturer because the electronic pins are in different places and can cause a serious problem at that point. So let's go ahead and prepare this camera for the class. Um, charge the battery, and we've already kind of secretly done that. Uh, let's go ahead and attach the lens. So I'm going to take off the body cap right here. We do have a white mounting index right here. We're going to take the rear lens cap off, and we're going to have another index right here on the lens. Actually, right there on the lens. Mount those two up right there and give the lens a little twist. We'll take off the lens cap. Set those aside, and we'll install the battery on the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and flip open the door. There's really only one way to install a battery. Close that in there, and then we're going to take a memory card. And this camera is kind of cool. We'll talk about this as we go along, but you can actually put two memory cards in here. And for now, we're just going to go ahead and put one memory card in, push it in, and close the door. And so what we want to do, and I want to make sure everyone uh, here in our live classroom, our live students, as well as everyone online, can just kind of follow along. Go ahead and turn the camera on. And uh, turn the mode dial, the big dial on the top left of your camera, to the green auto mode. And go ahead and just take a picture. Just make sure that your camera's working. I should see some flashes firing in here. All your flashes are popping up. I'm going blind. I feel like this paparazzi crew here. <laughs> All right, so I just want to make sure everyone's camera's working, uh, just to have a picture on the memory card to start with. Now, uh, we're going to do something really complicated right now. We're going to dive in and do something very sophisticated, so hang on. I have full instructions, so follow. What we're going to do here is we're going to turn the camera to the M mode for manual. This is where we're going to be for most of the class. And I want to turn some of the menus so that they stay on for a longer period of time. And so we're going to get more into this menu system later on. But if you press the menu button on the back of your camera, and over on the left-hand side, you want to navigate up and down till you get to the pencil. When it turns yellow, you are at the custom setting menu. You want to go to the right with your little tab, uh, your multi-selector on the back of the camera. And we're going to go to C, which is timers AE lock. Then you're going to go to the right again. And we're going to go down to C2. We're going to go to the right on that, and we are going to change it from six seconds to something longer. I'm going to set mine to 30 seconds. We're going to press OK, with the button right in the middle. And then we are going to go down to C4, monitor off delay. We will go to the right, and we're going to go down to where it says menus. We're going to go to the right, and we're going to change that to one minute. 
Next up, we're going to go to information display. It says 10 seconds to start with, and we're going to go down and set that at one minute. Now, these are things that you can go in later, or we, when we pass by them towards the end of this class, you can reset them if you want to, and there's a way you can reset all the functions. But this way, when you're playing with your camera in this class, the meter won't continue to, to turn off on you. It'll just make the rest of the class a little bit easier to work with. And then you can kind of set your camera down and uh, settle in for the next section. So as I said, you do need to have a bit of photography knowledge to know how to work this camera. Uh, even though you may know where all the buttons and what all the features of the camera do, if you don't know photography, it's going to be hard to get good photographs. And so let's just talk about some of the basic fundamentals of photography. And this information is uh, a part of a class that I teach here through Creative Live called Fundamentals of Digital Photography. It's a 10-week downloadable class that if you want to learn more about photography, it's a, it's a good way to get started. There's more than 20 hours of instructions, and it basically starts right at ground level and goes up to a, a fairly intermediate advanced level in the class. And so it's a good way to learn about photography. So let's take a look at some of the most important information that I, I hope you know or I will be happy to let you in on on this camera. So this camera is a digital single lens reflex camera. And one of the most important parts about that is that it has one main lens that the light is traveling through. It's a very high quality lens. And that is how you view the camera, you view the image as well as take the picture. Now there are lots of different lenses. There are wide angle lenses, there are telephoto lenses, and there are zoom lenses. And there's, uh, there's a lot more in lenses, but unfortunately this uh, class doesn't have time to talk all about the lenses, which is a great subject. Now when you focus, the lens elements will move back and forth to adjust for subjects that are closer to you or further away from you. Within the lens is an aperture unit. It's basically a, a hallway of light that can open and close. It never closes completely, but it allows you to control the amount of light coming in the lens. And so if we have a lens that starts at 1.4 and is wide open, and we, as we close down, each f-stop or aperture setting will close the amount of light and reduce it by 50%, excuse me, by 100%, 50%, sorry, <laughs> 100%, that'd be a lot of light. Basically, you're doubling or you're cutting the amount of light in half with each of these aperture changes. And so it's a great way for controlling light coming in the lens. Now, the second thing is, is that this aperture also controls the depth of field. And so if we were to take this imaginary lens and open it up to f1.4, it would have a very shallow depth of field. And so you can see the red hash marks over on the right-hand side. That are, that's indicating the area of focus, the depth of field. And as we change this aperture from 2.8 to f4, we're going to get more depth of field. And each step along the way, we get more and more depth of field. It's not a dramatic change at any one step, but it does add up to quite a big difference between the lens being fully wide open and the lens fully closed down. And using this for creative control and artistic reasons is very important in photography, as well as the simply controlling the amount of light coming in the camera. So back to our camera. As light comes in through the lens, it will then hit the mirror, and that is the reflex portion of the digital single lens reflex. Now the mirror is going to bounce the light upwards so that we can see what is going on. It's going to project an image onto the ground glass, and in order to see that ground glass, more easily, the light is going to be bounced around through a prism system and through a diopter, which is where we look through our camera in the viewfinder. And this makes the camera very convenient, easy to use, and it also allows us to see exactly what our camera is pointed at. We can see how telephoto or wide angle our lens is. We can see the effects of using filters. Uh, it's a very good system for a camera. Now, when you press the shutter release, the mirror needs to get up and out of the way so the light can make its way back to the image sensor. And so the image sensor is a very important part about the camera. We're going to talk a little bit more about this, but the size of it and the capabilities in low light, as well as its resolution, are some of its most important characteristics. But before the light gets back to the image sensor, it must pass through the shutter. And the shutter is a two-part system. There's a first shutter and a second shutter. And when you press the shutter release button, the mirror goes up. A first curtain will open up, allowing light to come into the sensor to expose the sensor for the image, 
and then a second curtain will come down and block the light off. When it's all finished, the mirror pops back down and returns the light through the viewfinder so that you can see what's going on. Uh, one important thing to note is that uh, you do not get to see what's happening while you are taking a picture. So if, you've saw, if you saw it through the viewfinder, you missed it. You, that's why you need to anticipate with these cameras. Now, that shutter unit is really important for controlling the amount of light as well as controlling uh, the way our subjects look in there. And so let's take a look at some shutter speeds. Here we are at 2,000th of a second, a very fast shutter speed for stopping something moving very quick like a bird in flight. A 500th of a second is a good shutter speed for stopping human action. So if you want to stop uh, somebody in sports or dance or anything like that, 500th of a second is a good shutter speed for that. 125th, kind of a moderate shutter speed, uh, is suitable for stopping some camels walking casually in the desert. When we go down to a 30th of a second, we're getting to a slower shutter speed. Here you can see that we've got a lot of blurriness because our subjects are moving very, very quickly. Down at an eighth of a second, you'll notice that the bridge at the bottom of the frame is sharp and in focus because a tripod was used for this shot but the people are blurry because they are walking at a casual pace. As we get into some slow shutter speeds at one half of a second here, water crashing over a rock is gonna look very blurry because it moves quite a bit in that period of time. And all the way down at 30 seconds, this may look like mist or clouds around mountaintops. It's actually water flowing in and around rocks on the shoreline of a beach. And so those very long shutter speeds can uh, be very interesting on getting some fun results from that. So we talked a little bit about that sensor and I wanna talk more about the size of the sensor. When you go into the camera store and you look at all the wonderful cameras that are available today, what may not be apparent to many purchasers of said cameras is the size and type of the sensor in the camera. And there is a variety of sensors in the cameras that are on the market today. And that is, as I said, one of the most important factors on the camera. And what's really important is the exact size of the sensor. So let's talk a bit about the size of the sensor. And we're gonna be looking at the cameras that use interchangeable lenses, uh, the main SLRs out there, and they use the three larger sizes. The D7000 uses one of the largest ones out there. Now the largest one out there is the exact same size as 35 millimeter film. And those of you who shot 35 millimeter are familiar with that. It's 24 by 36 millimeters in size, and they do make sensors that are exactly that size. And they call them full frame sensors. And it has what's called a crop factor of 1.0 because it's exactly the same as the 35 millimeter standard. Now, these sensors are great. Uh, the only problem is, is that they cost a lot of money. And so in order to save money, uh, different manufacturers have made smaller sensors. The one in use in the Nikon D7000 is what Nikon calls a DX sensor. It's a little bit smaller, 16 by 24 millimeters and it has a crop factor of 1.5. It doesn't see as much, it's basically 1.5 times smaller than the full frame sensor. So lenses will look a little bit differently as we go from full frame to DX. And we will talk more about this when we talk about lenses and accessories for this camera. Uh, the other standard is used uh, that is pretty common out there is the APS-C, which is just a little bit smaller that has a 1.6X sensor. But the one in your Nikon here has a 1.5 sensor. So that's a little bit about the digital single lens reflex. Uh, if, if there is more that you would like to learn about this, you may want to check out the Fundamentals of Digital Photography. It's a downloadable class here at Creative Live. And it's a, a good 10-week class, lots of hours, goes through all the basics. We spend a bit more time than I spent uh, just running through this, uh, learning about the basics. And so that's a, a good class for anyone who is new to photography. One of my absolute favorites. Thank you. Thank you.